Praise God. The message is taken today from the Gospel of John chapter 4. And in fact, uh, it's, it's the Samaritan woman who's actually the name of my mother. Her name's Fodini. And so it says this. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sitcha, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, you would, you, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said to him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. For you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I'm he. Praise God for his word. It was a bit lengthy reading, but I believe I wanted to just put the backdrop, put it the context. Amen. Thank God for his word. Jesus concludes by saying, I who speak to you am he. It's amazing that um, he makes it his need to go through Samaria, yeah, to go through that area, through that geographical place, to get to where he needed, where he wanted to be in Galilee. It was interesting. He had to go through Samaria, which was a, a rough terrain. We, as I said on a Friday, we drove through some, going towards Samaria. We encountered very a lot of adversity. In fact, I said when we were in Israel, 1999, that we took four minibuses, which had Hebrew writing on. Pastor Oliver would be interested in that. Uh, and uh, we were driving them ourselves, so we navigated, got, we, got, we came out the, the, the Jewish quarter areas, and we, we, went, we went past over to the Palestinian region, which was very hostile against the, uh, against the Jewish community. Uh, but we had Jewish vans, mini vans, and we were, uh, bus, buses, and we were driving, and we stopped at different locations to get refreshed, to get some supplies and things, and we had all the Palestinians beginning to gather around us, and next thing we know, they're throwing stones at the minibuses because they were Hebrew writing, and we had to get out there quickly. As the, as the film was saying, let's get out of here. We had to get out quickly. We all got back on the midst, driving for, for hours through Samaria. So we know it's a rough terrain. Nonetheless, uh, we got to Bethlehem at the end, which was good, coming back to the, those Jewish areas. Anyway, so to cut a long story short, 
Samara is a rough terrain, challenging place. It has a very vague and dark history. In fact, it was uh, the northern part of the Kingdom of Israel. And in 722, it was invaded, well, it was prior to that, the Assyrians came, invaded, took over, and uh, mixed, occupied the area. And so, as an outcome of that, the Jewish people intermarried with the other people that came into that area. And it was a high breed of people that were called Samaritans. And the Jews didn't like them, they looked down on them, they didn't believe they were pure, and they were looked at out as outcast. And one time when uh, they were challenging Jesus, they called him a Samaritan and that he was demon-possessed. He was a Samaritan and he was demon-possessed because who someone a Samaritan at that time was considered as an insult. In the same way, calling someone like a dog. The Gentiles were called dogs. And to call someone a dog or a Samaritan was a type of insult against somebody. In fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 48, this is what the narrative reads as follows. I wanted to put a context to put it to show you what was happening at that time. He says, And the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So they equated, they associated Samaritans with demons. They were demonized. Yeah, But Jesus responded and said to them in verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. He didn't disassociate with the Samaritans. He was happy to associate with the Samaritans because he came for all people. Jesus came to transcend everyone's prejudice and discrimination. So he says, I don't have a demon, but it doesn't say anything. He's silent about being a Samaritan because he wanted to identify with the Samaritans. So he made it a need for himself to go through Samaria to meet the Samaritans, to bring them into the commonwealth of God, God's salvation. That's how much love God has for everyone. Just because I may not like someone, you may not like someone, or we had a bad experience, God still loves everyone in spite of not because. And this woman, when Jesus begins the dialogue, he asks her for a water, for, for a drink. She responded, and she, she uh, reiterated, she, she repeated the, 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 the mindset of the people of the day. You Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans. You don't look at us in a positive way. Not only you don't like the Samaritans, but I'm also a woman that you shouldn't be speaking to at this particular time. Jesus transcends her prejudice, disqualifies her prejudice, and says, if you knew the gift of God, I'm here to, I've come to give you a gift. You haven't come to, I've come to you, you have not come to me. I've come to the place that people despise, that people speak against, that people look as an outcast. I've come to the place that people don't look favorably at. So in spite of wherever we are, God will come and find us in that place. If we can't get out of our place, God will find us in the midst of our situation. I wish I'm... Hallelujah, praise God. These powerful narratives these are, you know. And so, uh, so when the Lord wants to give an example of a, of, a, of a person being a person of God, a man or woman of God, in fact, when the lawyers were asking him the question, who is my neighbor, yeah, in Luke, he's speaking in the Gospel of Luke in chapter, you know, he's, he's, he's telling us in chapter 10 about answering the question, who is my neighbor, he speaks, he gives the parable of the man leaving Jerusalem, going down towards Jericho and fell among thieves and was stripped, beaten, and left half, half dead. And so he's, he's in that situation and, and a priest passed by, he, he looked at him and went the other way. The Levite passed by who should have been there to show compassion and meet that man, the person's um, needs, who was leaving Jerusalem, implication he was a Jew, they just annoy, uh, avoided him. And he told them the Samaritan comes that way, looks at him, has compassion. Not only has compassion, he pours oil and wine. He, he, he cost him something of his material uh, 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 possessions. And then he puts him on his own animal and takes him to the inn and gives two denarii to the innkeeper to look after him. And he was a Samaritan. Wow, you're telling us that the person we look down on, that we, doubt, we, we look as an outcast, he's the one who showed compassion to one of our people. Yeah. And you're telling me that you're telling us that this man who's a Samaritan that we don't like, God loves. God approves of. Because not what we say is what we do. Because salvation, the, the, the criteria for salvation is not what we say. The criteria of salvation is not what we know. The criteria of salvation is not our nationality or our heritage. Our, the, the qualification of salvation is how we live in reflection to the love of God. 
That's the qualification. When I was hungry, did you feed me? He didn't say when I was hungry, give me a dissertation or explain to me the Trinity or tell me what denomination you went from or tell me where you were qualified or tell me what you have in your bank account. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you dress me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? Did you show me through your actions? He says, they're the ones who are going to sit at the right side when I come in my glory. He didn't say your denomination is going to save you. Praise God. And so he makes it his need to meet people who are the downtrodden, who are the marginalized, who are the outcasts, who even feel bad about themselves because the statement she made, she had a low view and opinion about herself. She had a low self-esteem about herself. Wow. But he went to the well, Jacob's well, knowing that she was going to come there at that particular. God knows all things. As I said earlier, God knows all things. He's not omniscient, omnipresent. He feels all things. Yeah? So he went waiting for her, and it was the sixth hour. Praise God. It was the sixth day that God made man in his image and his likeness. Six is a symbolic number of God's recreating, doing something. And he was about to do something in her life change her life forever that she'll never be the same again because when you encounter the Lord I can tell you you're never the same again hallelujah I've never been the same something that's a bad thing praise God so he waits six hours and he goes to a significant place Jacob's well wow amazing he went to Jacob's well and uh and what that represents symbolizes you know, Jacob's well water symbolizes something, it symbolizes life. And she'll go make an effort. It was tedious. In the, it, 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 six hour, it must have been very, very uncomfortable time of the day to make the journey from the city to go to the well to draw water to take it back to her home. And she was doing that on a regular daily basis to go and do this, the menial work that she was doing, hard labor. She went to get water. And she found the water giver himself. He says, Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37, please follow, follow the reading. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Wow. He went to the woman. He made it his need. He, he made it his priority to go. He said he, had, he needed to go through Samaria. He wanted to go through Samaria to meet this woman at the place of her need. He says, he who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Are we thirsty? We wanted the, those waters. And what do those waters do? He says, if you take this water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. Because Jacob's well uh, represents a temporal water, temporal quenching of one's thirst. It represents philosophy. It represents religion. Jacob's well was a representation of the Torah. But Jesus comes to give us life and grace and the, that in more abundance. So the well now is not just objective outside of us. The well now is within us. I was, I was speaking to someone. That Christ, when you enthrone Christ in your heart, you have the well in abundance flowing, not from outside into you, but from inside outwardly. Because he's the one who gives the water that no one will thirst again. So if you have Christ in you, then the water flows from with you outside. Hallelujah. Praise God. And that's why Jesus desired to come and join. That's why we're covering the book of Revelation. Because the Lord is speaking to the church. The seven churches in the book of Revelation. And in, the, and in John chapter, sorry, Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, he makes a statement. He says, I stand at the door and knock. Who does he stand at the door and knock to? To the people who profess to be the church. So what's the implication? The implication, he's not inside. So they don't have that water that can quench not just their thirst, but other people's thirst. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What's, what strange statement to Jesus make, declaration for him to say to a church. We're supposed to have Christ in us. He calls it the church. But yet we can have a form of religion, but no power. Because we don't allow God to take authority in our lives. We don't enthrone in him uh, in our lives. Yeah? And he's standing from outside. And we need to let him establish himself in our lives. Because when he establishes, everything becomes different. Because Paul says, in my weakness, he manifests his perfect strength. Because when he's in my life, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. 
the divine contradiction. When I am poor, that's when I'm rich. Because then I put everything in the context. And then I, I define what wealth, true wealth is. Yes, there is material wealth, but that wealth is not true wealth. One of the richest men I remember recall when I was growing up, I heard of about Onassis, who was a Greek tycoon. Yeah? He was a Greek tycoon. He was multi-million or billionaire. But when he was dying, he would give all his wealth to have a few more moments of life. He couldn't buy that. There's a commodity money cannot buy. Money cannot really buy health. Money cannot buy extension of life. The pharaohs with all their treasures still went into the tomb. I wish I'm speaking to them. But only one person stepped out the tomb. The way, the truth and the life stepped out the tomb. Praise God. That's what God offers us. That's true wealth. But the rest of it is just temporary to get us by and navigate this life. I wish I'm speaking to someone. And when you know the, the, the author of life, you're the richest person in the world. Hallelujah. You are the, I'm telling you, I'm not, this is not rhetoric. I know that I rejoice. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. And so this woman encounters the, 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 the living water. Hallelujah. And this is why he says, I stand at the door. And, and you know, sometimes we get caught up with world's distractions, razzmatazz. But if we still and know that he's God, things that do change in our lives. You're smiling and people don't know why you're smiling. You know, you'll be on the train tomorrow. If you're, tra- you're commuting on the train and you'll be tr- moving around and you'll be having a smile on your face. And everyone will be frowning. <laughs> it's a Monday morning blues. They can sing the blues to you on the train. You just have to look at someone. It's sometimes it's death warmed up. People cannot even look at each other on the train. You have... 50 people, one little sardine tray, and they all look in a different direction. Because they've got blues. But you rejoicing, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, Jesus asks her for water. And we're told here in verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a woman of Samara came to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. He initiated the conversation. And we love him because he first loved us. He took the first step that we take the other step. And when we take one step, he takes 99. He initiates that dialogue. He goes the extra mile before he asks us to do anything. And then he says, and so he asked her for a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the woman said, of Samara said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So straight away she puts the barriers there. And Jesus he breaks down every wall, every barrier of emotion. Whatever you're encountering, God will break that down in order to transform you and the transformation begins from within yeah it comes from within. it doesn't matter what we look externally it's god is dealing with the heart on the heart level that's how god deals on the heart level and so uh jesus answer said to if you knew the gift of god and who it is who says to give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water you know straight away he brings there to her focus uh gifts the gift and that's what the lord does is a giver continually through the scripture when we when we have a, a di- we, we have the divine characteristic attributes you're naturally it's easier to give because the the old, natu- the old man has what we call rigor mortis see when you get rigor mortis you're locked in that position your hands are stiff you can't open your hands. They had to prize them open when you got rigor mortis. The old man has, because he's dead, walking dead. Rigor mortis cannot give. When life comes, it's open. And the beautiful thing is when it opens, it's not just about giving, it's about receiving as well. Because when you open your hand, it's not only about what you give out, because God will always give you more than what you release. Huh? Yeah? And that's, he brings life. And your outlook changes. You go back to 
not just 2020 view, you've seen a complete different view, but dimension. You've seen the fourth dimension. You know, I gave you that. See, these are educationals, and I often say, my messages are educational. You leave there here and you say, that taught me a lesson. I hope in a good way. When I showed about the little ants running around on a white piece of paper, and then the man put the, the felt tip around it, and the ant couldn't go any further. It, it was stuck behind the line. There was nothing real. There was nothing real in front of it, and the ant couldn't b- cross over that, that marker, that, that felt tip pen. Can we just show it quickly? Have we got it there? It couldn't go over because of the vision perception it has. It can only see in two dimensions. Yeah? It was looking just at the line and he thought it was a wall because it couldn't see beyond. It couldn't see the third dimension. So it could only see the second dimension and he thought there was a barrier. There was nothing there but it couldn't cross over. And that's what the world presents us. Puts us in a cage, blocks us, locks us in and puts us in a prison. And we feel we can't go beyond that. We're limited in what we can do. Can we just put it very quickly? See there? Watch. Okay, now let me say, I've never met this ant before, so it's not, it's not working to a script. <laughs> but look, and this is how we behave. We're locked in a certain way of minds thinking. And when you break that, that stronghold, you step and say, my goodness, I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know I can do this. I didn't know I can achieve that. Because you have permission, God gives you permission to think outside the box. So, but the world wants to bang you back, knock you down, it beat you down into that place, that limitation that the world says, you can't, that's fine, no further. When I was teaching in school, secondary school, in 1994 back then, you'd be surprised, you, would, you never could imagine I was that old. 1994, and I was marking the, 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 the children's GCSE papers, preparation papers. The head of the department came and said to me, I, I marked one of, the, one of the girls, it was an all-girls school, I marked one of the girls an A. And she came and said, why have you marked this student an A? I said, because her, her work merits an A. No, no, she's a, C, she's a C-level student, you can't mark it an A, because we have to be, you know, take the overall. I said, I said but she's an A. She said, no, no, you've got to mark it down to a C. Why? Because her work is consistently C, and we have to have like, you know, the average. Yeah, but you, you see, you're putting a person in a category that by doing that, that person can only th- think from a C level. But if you put an A, maybe her next work might be an A plus or might be an A double star. Yeah? And you've got to give people permission to achieve and, 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 and what they've done, you merit, not on their past, what they, what they produced before, but what they, the possibilities they can achieve. Perhaps in your classes, she can only get a C, but in my classes, she gets an A. <laughs> you see? And that's the way, this is the, what it's supposed to be. And people think they can't, and they block them. This is you look like this ant is blocked in that place. It can't go beyond that place. I want to give people permission to feel they're not chickens, that they're eagles. That you can fly. You cannot mimic an eagle, but you are an eagle. You can spread your wings. You can soar into the, into the heavens, into the skies. Because you have that permission. That's why Paul says, I can do all things for Christ who strengthens me. I use myself as an example because that's the only example I have. I can't say Joe Bloggs. So I don't want to give you. I don't want to give you stories, Jack and Nori. I tell you things, real things that I've experienced, that I've seen in my journey, yes. which is which is amazing. Praise God. God. So she starts putting obje- objections because this is how we're supposed to think. You're this and I'm that and I can't think beyond that box. And God says I've broken the box. The box is no longer there. In fact, you've kept me in the box. <laughs> Yeah, you've kept me in the Ark of the Covenant, not only kept me in the box, you carry me about where you want me to go, and you've put me in a place, isolated me, you quarantined me, you put me behind the curtain, and you don't let anyone visit me, and only the high priest comes into the Holy of Holies one time a year, and I've had enough being alone. I want to break out of the box. And on, on when Christ was crucified, the temple, uh, in the, uh, uh, the curtain in the temple was rent from top to bottom, ripped open, and God, uh, for one time, stepped out and said, I've been there too long. 
So the Lord says, I needed to come to see you. I need someone to talk to because my people don't talk to me. <laughs> they want to kill me, my people. But you, I want to talk to people who want to talk to me, who celebrate me. I don't want to talk to people who tolerate me. I want to put people, talk to people who celebrate me and respect me. It's been too long that we've been in a straitjacket of negativity, of oppression, of low esteem about ourselves. We need to break out of that and say, you know, I can do that. All things are possible, praise God. And so Jesus answered, said, and said, and Jesus answered said, so if you knew the gift of God, you would, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You know, I love sparkling water. If you give me a choice, still water or sparkling water, I always go for the sparkling water. And you know that there's a difference because sparkling water, when you shake it, flows out. Still water is, whew. I don't know, man. And it feels good, sorry. I'm discriminating against uh, sparkling water. But that's what the Lord has given us, sparkling water. Heavenly water. Praise God. If you knew the gift of God. Well, she didn't know the gift of God, but he says, know the truth to his disciples and the truth will set you free. If you knew, you'll be, you'll be liberated, you'll be emancipated, you will be set free. And so this is what the Lord presents to us today. That living water that he offered the Samaritan woman is freely given. You don't pay for that water. It's freely received, freely given. When we give a contribution to the church, it's not given it to God. It's given to extend the work that goes on through the house of God that we help other people through different means to, to, to have their own personal one-to-one -one experience with, with, with the Lord. And then she responds and says to him this, and this one I want to delve in a, few, a bit deeper spiritually, then we're going to come into prayer, we're going to have a baptism, we're going to have a presentation of a certificate, it's going to be a wonderful occasion. Yeah, we're really celebrating what God is doing. Then the one said to him, sir... Again, raises an objection. Wow, isn't it interesting? He offers us, and all the time you're thinking negativity. Have you ever encountered those pessimists who always contradict you with why you can't do something? I always like to say why I can do it. I'm an eternal optimist. Yeah? I always like to see what I can do, not what I cannot do. Praise God. And so with that mindset we need to have, we have to have an optimistic mindset that not the cup, that your cup is not half full. Your cup is overflowing. And you know, some people say, my cup is half empty. No, my cup is half full. No, my cup is not half full. My cup is overflowing. And because my cup overflows, other people can benefit from my overflow. People can benefit from your overflow. But if you say, my cup is half full, you're still limiting yourselves. Who said your cup is half full? Yeah? Why, why do you even limit yourself then, my cup is half full? Why don't you have it full? <laughs> Praise God. And so she again puts her, he says, you have nothing to draw from. Limited. Uh, uh, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Wow, the water that he gives, he says, hey, are, are, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drunk from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? So are you greater than Jacob, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? What well, Jesus said later in the gospel, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. This is too, are you, you're not yet 50 years old and you say you've seen Abraham? He says, yes, before Abraham, I am, I am, I am the creator. Oh, yes, I am greater than Jacob. I am greater than, I. he says, greater than Solomon is here, he said. And that's who, that's who we celebrate today. That's who we serve today. The greatness of our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's amazing. And so she puts the limitations there. And you know, Jacob was, was uh, the son of Isaac. And Isaac was the son of Abraham. And you see, Abraham dug wells, we're told. Right, and the Philistines came and they put earth in the wells, in the water of, of Abraham's wells. And it was later on Isaac went back and re dug the wells of, of, um, of, of his father, and, and flow, crystal clear water was flowing in the wells of, of Abraham, whom the Philistines covered with earth. 
And we have the same experience today. Because when God digs your wells, the Philistines will try and put earth in the wells of your life. I explain to you metaphorically what that means. What that means is the earth represents earthly ideas and earthly interpretation of the word of God. In Genesis chapter 26 verse 15, this is what we're told regarding what Isaac did in relation to the wells of his father that the Philistines uh, covered with earth. It says this, now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, and they filled them with earth. Okay, just lift the Greek up very quickly. Yes, the word is yes for earth. All right, I want you to think about this. I might take it a bit deeper, but we're going to be finished very shortly. For those who are thinking where they're going to go later on. And, and they covered them with earth. Now, this is metaphorically, this is saying this is there's a spiritual lesson because the, the, the scripture is for you and me, not for the people before Christ because they couldn't understand it. Without Jesus Christ and the Spirit, you cannot understand what's happening here. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 7 verse 14, very quickly, we just quickly passed it. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. So then this meaning it's a spiritual, you can only get the understanding through the Spirit. Yeah. In spiritual. So what's happening here? There's a spiritual lesson here. So when he says they covered it with earth, meaning they filled it with human worldly understanding. Because Adam and Eve were made from the dust of the earth. Yeah, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the same Hebrew word used here for earth uh, is afar. The Hebrew word is afa, is the same word that is used here. And the Lord God formed man of the afa of the ground, the earth. So they put earthly interpretation on spiritual realities. And Jesus came to take off the earthly and restore the spiritual understanding of the meaning of the word of God into our lives, who we truly are. Not what the world wants you to be, but who we truly are. Because the world wants to make God in his image and his likeness, but really we should restore back to God's image and God's likeness. Yeah, you'll get that later. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So, so they're covered. So, so she has a, 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 a carnal understanding of what's really going on there. You don't have anything physical, material to draw it out because her mindset is on, on the physical, not on the spiritual. Because when you have the spiritual, you don't need physical means to get the revelation. God reveals it to us through in, engagement, interaction with him in a spiritual way. He downloads it. You know, when you have your computers, you want to download things. We keep doing this all the time, uploading, downloading. Well, God's downloading his revelation. He doesn't need anything material, anything physical to download it. It's his spirit who pours it into our hearts, into our minds. That's why Jesus said that he had many things to teach them. But it was when the Holy Spirit came, they will understand from a spiritual level and dimension. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay, let's just go back here very quickly. We finished very shortly. Amen. Praise God. Uh, you have nothing to draw. And are you greater than the father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Meaning, so his sons and his livestock. So everyone was benefited, beneficiaries of Jacob's well. Jesus answered, said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I should give him will never thirst. But the water that I should give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Then we said to him, sir, wouldn't you like that water? Just meant to give you that water, gives you springs up to everlasting life. She says to him, sir, in fact, the, 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 the Greek is interesting here. In verse, let me just go, um, verse 15. The woman said, Legi pros afton yini, kirie. The word kirie is like, Lord, Adonai. She says, Lord, those me do don't do give me this water. In a midipso, mide erhume, and dathe and lin. That I don't keep coming back here. Yeah, make things easy for me. And he responds and he, he goes through this dialogue. He, he says to, so he, he says to, I have no, no, he says, let me just go. He says, Jesus said to him, this is verse 60, go call your husband and come here. That's a loaded question that he asked her. She responded and she said to him, I have no husband. Jesus responded and said, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one who you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. 
And I want to finish on these last few thoughts. We all have five husbands. And before the coming of Jesus, we don't actually have a true husband. The, one of Jesus' titles is the bridegroom, or nymphios, and he's coming for a bride. We may have partners in this life, but till death do us part. The nymphios is forever. And we have five husbands. And I tell you what the five husbands are for you and me. The five husbands are our five senses. Touch, taste, see, smell, hear, our five senses. They control us on the, on the level, on the material domain. The sixth husband is a spiritual relationship with God. The one you do have now is not your husband. I'm your sixth husband, but I'm not your husband because you haven't gone through the ritual of wedding, of matrimony with me. And that's relationship that we are connecting spiritually, that you transcend your five husbands that keep you on the lower plane and you need to ascend into the higher place, the spiritual dimension. Praise God. Yes, whether it's physical husband, she had a different story. I'm talking about the spiritual metaphors, the spiritual parallels to this. That we, that our five senses are the ones that control us often more than not. We're sensual people, we're physical people. All we want to touch, see, taste and experience. But God says transcend that, come into the spiritual realm. And the things that you think, you think the world will satisfy, it will never satisfy you. But I will give you, I'll, you'll never thirst. When you come to me, you'll never thirst again. The physical senses, your five husbands in this world always want you wanting more, the next experience, the next fix, the next this and that. But when you come to me, it's all she wrote. Is you're, you're in, a, in a place of blissful rupture lift, in transforming in the spirit. That no, nothing in the world can compare what I am and who I am in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. And then you, that's when you'll step over. Because the five senses control religion. I want to, I want to say this. I, I know people may think I keep knocking religion. I don't knock religion. I just speak about relationship. Faith in God. Okay, because the five senses control us in a, in a religious way. Okay, and if, when, you, when you come transcend the religious way, you know that God fills all things. That's why Jesus responded and said to her, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Jesus said to a woman, Believe me, the hour is coming, and you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, for you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And then he says to her, this is with profound statement, he says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. We don't need a shrine to worship God. We don't need even a physical building to worship God. You know, sometimes we go to places and there's altars and it's lovely, it's not a problem. Altars and people walk up to the altars and when they're leaving the church, they're leaving backwards because they don't want to turn their back on God. One second. God is om omnipresent. God is there, but he's here. God doesn't come to me. I walk in God. God is as, as much here as he's at the back of this building. So if I'm here, he's here. If I go there, he's there, but he's here. So I can't turn my back on God because he feels all things. So I don't have to be the religious, this pious, just looking back. He feels all things. He says, I don't have to go to Jerusalem. I'm here. I create Jerusalem is here. That's why it says in the book of Revelation, John says that Jerusalem, he says, Egypt and Sodom, where they crucified our Lord. Because it's, it's, it's what you do in the place that determines what the place is. So this place can become a paradise or can become a hell. Being, the same, being in the same place, you can either be in paradise or hell. Being in the same place at the same time. You can create the paradise of God here right now by having the joy of the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. By saying some praiseworthy things, that singing hymns to God, you can make it a paradise or you can make it a hell. The choice is in our hands. How we move forward, how our emotions develop, is the choice is in our hands. Praise God. I want to leave it there and... If we stand together, praise God, praise God. And just to say, 
a few points I want to make before we come to the baptisms and the, and the certificate presentations. I just want to say that um, think of when you go home, think of the messages that you receive. Think how they apply into your lives. Be encouraged. Whatever negativity is around your life, always know God will always have the last word. History declared it from before. History has declared that God always has the last word. I'm telling you. And if, you're, if, you're, if you put yourself centralized, you put yourself in that place, you know, you are in the best place. Hallelujah. Praise God. You are blessed. You are highly favored. I want to praise them to just come up to join me. Hallelujah. Praise God.